Welcome back to economics. We're in chapter 14 and we're talking about government expenditures. Our first two videos talked about money coming in, where it's coming in and how it's coming in. Now we're going to talk about money going out. We look at what the government is spending the tax dollars on. Uh, we kind of break it into Mr. Clem terms. They buy either stuff, which is our first one, and that would be considered goods and services. So things like military spending on both tanks and planes and guns or payments to the soldiers, uh, looking at your government buildings and your employees, uh, federal prisons, both building them and the guards who are in charge of it, or the IRS, okay, your auditors, or your national parks and preserves. Okay? Just like most businesses or consumers, you pay for goods or services. The other one, is what we're calling transfer payments. Now, if we jump forward to the next unit, we talk about things like gross domestic product and what counts as an economic uh, activity. Transfer payments are not gonna count, right? This is me taking tax dollars out of my paycheck, my company matching it, sending it to the Social Security Administration, and then that directly goes out to grandma and grandpa in the form of a Social Security payment or Medicare or unemployment benefits, right? These don't necessarily buy anything. Uh, they're just money in and then out versus money coming in. The government then makes a choice and says, hey, I think we ought to go build a new B-2 bomber, whatever they got going on. When we look at where the government spends its money on, uh, it spends it in kind of two places. We have our mandatory spending and we have our discretionary spending. If you look at it from like a, a personal finance view, the mandatory stuff, it's always gonna show up every month or every year. R amounts may change, but it's always gonna be there. Your discretionary is kind of what you choose or like your flexible bills from an individual. As we look at it, the mandatory spending, the fixed part, is things like social security payments or Medicare payments or interest on our national debt. We don't have a choice in those, right? The, the Congress and the, and the president, when they start looking at this, they have to spend this money. Okay, they don't get a choice as to whether they do or don't wanna spend it, they have to. About two thirds of our budget is made up of these mandatory spending items. Now, Indirectly, uh, I guess the Congress could pass some new law that says, well, we're going to stop making Social Security payments or Medicare payments or interest on our national debt, but you need a law to make that change. That's not just something they could decide on a year to year basis. One third of the government spending is what we're calling discretionary. Those are the things that the government gets to choose on. So if we have a $3 trillion spending budget, two of the $3 trillion is on stuff that they don't have a say, that $2 trillion is already spent. Government's going to talk about, hey, let's look at where we should spend this other $1 trillion. Now, the last time I checked, we were right about $5.5 trillion. So they're arguing, discussing almost $1.8 trillion of the 5.5. about 3.6 trillion already out the door, right? They don't necessarily have it, uh, saying it, that money's already gone, okay? As we're looking in the textbook, jump forward to page 412, we're gonna take a look at the process on how the government puts a budget together. We looked at what they're spending their money on, goods and services transfer payment, whether it's considered mandatory or discretionary spending. Now let's go look at how they get the whole deal going. Our federal budget is a calendar year, but it's unique where it starts on October 1 and it ends on September 30th. Now, most of your regular businesses start January 1, they end December 31st, and then they start up the next year. Uh, the federal government doesn't do that. Why? I don't know. Don't have a good answer why they do it different. They just do it different. How does it start? How does our federal budget start? 
it starts out with the president. Right now, it is Mr. Trump. He, along with the Office of the Management and Budget, essentially his accountants, are going to look at what they think they have coming in in revenue, right, taxes, both from us in payroll and corporate income taxes and Social Security, Medicare. They're then going to look at what their mandatory spending plans are, right? That's already kind of chewing up part of the revenue. Then he starts looking at, well, what kind of discretionary spending do I think is a priority to me? So Trump thinks it up. And again, we're way overly simplifying this. Trump thinks it up. He gets his accounts to crunch the numbers. He then sends it down the pipe to our Congress. Once Trump and the OMB get their ideas done, they send it to the House of Representatives. Okay? And the House of Representatives is the big one. That one is the 435 member one. That one is uh, people are represented by the size of your state. So a state like Minnesota, we have eight representatives. Um, a state like, say, North Dakota, maybe a little bit smaller in population, maybe they do not have as many representatives, as many voices at the table as you were. A state like, say, California or New York, more heavily populated, they would have more representatives. The House takes the discretionary spending and they're going to break it into 13 parts. 12 individual parts of different appropriations committees like Department of Defense or uh, Department of Labor, and then one group that kind of oversees all of it, right? So they take the pie piece, they pull it into 13 parts, and they say, hey, you guys go deal with the DOD, and you guys go work at this, and you guys go work at that. And all of these little subcommittees take the plan, take the president's plan, but they also have their own opinion because they represent some states. They tweak and adjust and they come up with the, we should spend this much money on this particular project, this much money on this particular project. They then turn around and glom those 12 different individual parts together and they turn around and send it on to the Senate. The Senate is the smaller one. The Senate is 100 people, two per state. Um, so no one state has more say than the other state. The Senate then does the same thing. Now, they don't just sit and wait for the House. They kind of get the same appropriations year after year after year. So they kind of start planning their budget because they know what 12 subsets are going to come at them. So they kind of start planning out theirs. They then get the house plan. They lay it out and go, yeah, I agree with that. Mm, I wouldn't have done it that way. The Senate kind of puts together their own budget or their own plan for that discretionary spending. A lot of times those two are very different, right? So president starts it with the office of management and budget. Send it to the House, break it apart, put it back together. Send it to the Senate, break it apart, put it back together. The House and the Senate plans are often very different, so usually a joint House and Senate conference committee will sit down and look at, hey, here was the House plan, here's the Senate plan, let's make some adjustments. There's got to be some give and take because they're limited by the approximated tax revenue they got coming in or how much they're willing to borrow. So they start crunching their numbers together on, all right, here's what we think we got. They take the joint House and Senate plan and they send it back to the president. The president looks at it and he's got a couple ideas. He's like, yep, love it, game on. Nope, hate it, try again, or somewhere in between. Right? It may not look anything like what he originally thought. Right? He's looking at it from a big 10,000-foot view. I think we ought to spend $1 trillion on the military. He sends it to the House. The House then says, hey, we got about a trillion dollars to spend on the military. What should we do with it? Build more bombs or guns or B2 or open up a base or close a base or whatever that happens to be. Senate does the same thing. Uh, put it back together, and it may come back at a trillion dollars for the military. It may be more, it may be less. 
probably never less. And it may not, well, I don't know if I'd have done that. Trump saying, eh, I don't think I'd have spent it there. It's like, well, but you gave it to us. We said, here's where we think we ought to go with it. He comes back and says, ah, I don't like that. I think you ought to try again. Trump may veto the budget and say, nope, that's not what I'm willing to sign. It could then go back to the House and Senate for recrunching of the numbers. Now, the House and the Senate could override the president's veto. They could say, you know what? No, this is a good plan. We're going to stick with it if they have two-thirds of a vote. Right. So 67 of your senators or 67 percent of your 435 House members, you know, 290 of them to say, nope, the president shot it down. We're going to override the president shooting it down and say, we're going to roll with this plan. So one of the assignments we're going to work on is we're going to look at both the House or the Senate Appropriations Committees. We're going to look at which are the 12, what do they do, and specifically who is a part of each of those Appropriations Committees. We're going to take a break now and we'll come back with another video on some additional government spending.